Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for making it out early. If you're anything like us, you've been probably going pretty hard the last couple of days slash weeks. So getting here at 11 is pretty awesome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Maura Duval Griffin. I work at Audio Machine. I've been a trailer music supervisor and um, for about 15-ish years, and uh, I work at a trailer music library now called Audio Machine. I work with our composers to do custom work and uh, build up the catalog of trailer music. And I want to introduce my fellow panelists. Actually, you guys should introduce yourselves. You'll do a much better job than I will in this state. I'm uh, Chris Bragg, and I own a company called Ghost Rider Music. Uh, we do custom music for trailers and advertising. Uh, I'm Todrick Spaulding. I'm the director of music at Mob Scene. We're a theatrical marketing agency uh, in Los Angeles, California. So I just want to run through a couple of the real basics. So when we talk about doing music for trailers, this is strictly the advertising for the movies. It's the music that we work on typically does not end up in the movie. It doesn't end up on the soundtrack unless can. some, some cre it can, but because we're working so far ahead of the release of the movie, it, it, things can happen. But typically speaking, we're just talking about the marketing. And very quickly, we'll just say, no, it's not the same music from the movie in the trailer. Because that's always the first question. Isn't right, it just exactly. me? Um, another thing that I wanted to just point out, we're, we're typically with what we're going to be talking about is the main trailers, teasers, TV spots. There are lots of other marketing pieces behind the scenes and all that stuff, but we're not going to necessarily get into that when we're talking about the structure of a trailer track. Um, and the other thing that's different about working in trailers and trailer music is that um, we never really or rarely have the opportunity to score a picture. So a lot of times you're creating this track um, either to a brief or to um, you know what you what you think the market is looking for. So that's kind of what we wanted to dig into is when you don't have picture and you don't have a specific thing saying like, okay, we have this Marvel movie and the filmmakers want this type of sound. You know, you don't necessarily always have that guidance when you're trying to just create music. Um, so our, our mission is to kind of give you guys a sense of what music supervisors are listening for, what editors are looking to utilize in their cuts, and how it all kind of comes together. So we have a, we have a shtick for you. So we thought <laughs> we, thought we would uh, sort of reenact a scenario. Bring, bring. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, so this is how it works before we get into how we really start making a music cue. When we get a, at a trailer shop and we get a job in, our client is the marketing department at a studio. So one of our clients will call us at the shop and say, we've got this movie, we're going to put you guys on it, we want you to cut a trailer. Uh, give us an idea of how to sell this movie. That's usually the only directive we get at, up front is let's see what you guys come up with for ideas of how we get, ways to get into this film. So then, internally at my agency, my producer who's got the client, my editor who's gonna cut the piece, maybe my graphics guy who might be doing all the motion graphics and titles, and myself will sit in a room and we'll talk about how do we sell this movie? What are the, what's the audience? Maybe we'll, we'll screen the film, we'll watch it, and we'll take notes on who's the audience, what's the demographic that we're gonna try to reach with this film? Tonally, what are we, where's the, where's the What's the tone of this? Like, is it a thriller? Is it, are we trying to go more highbrow and do, you know, uh, something for the coasts, they like to say. And, um, and just to quickly touch on, like, the timeline of this is usually so far ahead that you might not even be watching a completed feature. You might be lo looking at a, an assembly from dailies. You mm -hmm. might even be reading a script yep. and coming up with teaser concepts. Yeah, it really depends. Like, it could be everything from, like she's saying, like I've done movies where it's like three pencil stills for a Disney movie, where you're like, well, we're going to cut a trailer out of these three pencil stills. Music's going to win it. You know? uh, or sometimes it's like, like you know, we'll work on a, you know, Planet of the Apes or something, and it's a bunch of guys in green suits running around, and there's no apes. You know, or you know, it's Optimus Prime, and he's just attached to a yardstick, and it's the head running around. You know? um, so in those instances, we're trying to cut stuff. The music's got to do a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, but also there's times too where we get a project in and they've already been working on it for months and they haven't cracked it yet and then we get put on it and they're like, cool, we gotta turn a trailer around in four days. 
So this process can either be a really lengthy process or it can be forced into like a really short timeline. So once that happens and we've decided either on a source piece of music or it's gonna be a custom score or what, what genre of music we're gonna go to, then we bring in people like Chris Bragg who's gonna do all the sweetening, what we call it, or trailerizing the track. So if we find a piece of source music, oftentimes, say we pulled a Jimi Hendrix song. Jimi Hendrix is amazing, but the production in 1969 or 68 doesn't hold up next to the giant Hans Zimmer trailer that doesn't come right before it. So in that space, in, in those speakers in a movie theater where you're hearing this premium experience of sound, the production quality has to be at a certain level so that you don't feel a dip in excitement and the impact. And we're gonna play some examples, both of trailers with sort of uh, traditional trailer music, but also some sweetened tracks and some tracks that are, you know, just pop songs or hip hop songs that, that get used, get used in trailers all the time, just so that you can sort of start to hear and visualize what we're really talking about. So once we've decided, so if for instance, we, for our first example, we were on the campaign for The Dirt, which is a new Netflix uh, Motley Crue biopic. Um, and we we're early working on the teaser. The idea was, well, how do we do something with Home Sweet Home? That's the big song for the band. Um, and we really want to get into it. But when we actually looked at the track, we said, well, there's not a lot to this track. It's got basically two parts, but we have three acts to cover. We, you know, in a trailer structured, and we'll get into this, but the a trailer structured in three acts, first act, where you're bringing an audience in, you're establishing a setting, a tone, a world that you're entering. A second act where you're giving you all your story points, you're meeting the villain, you're meeting, seeing the conflict. Uh, and then a third act, which is your, oh shit, this is gonna be the craziest movie you ever saw, big shots, montage, or here's all the head turns that are gonna make you cry, or here's all, whatever the thing is to get you cast invested. Run. Invest the cast run. Oh, this is gonna be an Oscar movie. Whatever the, th the thing is. No matter what we're doing, every trailer operates in, the, in those parameters. Whether we go big in the back end or go small in the back end, we break the rules, we don't, it's all fitting into this parameter of these three act pieces, which we'll, we'll get deeper into. So anyway, at that point, I call this guy and we're on the dirt and I say, hey man, like, we need a first act. We need something that emotionally brings you into this movie um, before we reveal that we're on Home Sweet Home and people go, oh, that song. Uh, and so we, we tasked him with like, okay, give us a new, open to Home Sweet Home, tease it for us, but don't tease it so, don't be so obvious with it. We want you to feel like a little bit of like, oh, that's what this is when it kicks in. And uh, I think he did a pretty good job. So let me play it first, and then you can talk about kind of how you dug into the track. So you can see that there's, we've added a bunch of stuff and a lot of those things are so we can hang shots on. Like the language that we're usually speaking as music supervisors when we're talking to a composer is breaking down a visual language from an editor and bringing it into a musical space with a composer. So for an editor, he's looking for things to hang big shots on, to have moments that'll, that'll give you goosebumps or make you feel something. 
and then how we have music to support those big shots and make it all marry together. Um, so that's why you hear those big hits and all that stuff, because on every one of those is either a, a card or a shot or whatever that's gonna be something that like gets your attention, you know? So what do you do, Chris, when I call you? Um, usually I'll start out kind of, I mean on this one I just had to kind of figure out how to get into that track without giving away that it was that track completely. So it's, you know, how, how far can I strip that down without um, kind of losing that vibe, I guess. So. But normally, but normally, how do you do it? <laughs> just, <I> mean, <laughs> What's the first thing? You turn your computer on, you're like, all right, we're going to go. Yeah, turn, turn on my computer, and then I just, <laughs> I don't know. It was a long but night last night, you guys. Yeah. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> it's really fun. Uh, well, I mean, so with that cue, though, like, I mean, we've talked before about, like, you know, how big can you get and then, and then scaling back from there and the idea of uh, space in a, in a track. Like, how do you approach it? Like, if you know that the end is gonna be that Motley Crue thing, you know that's as big as we're gonna get, like, are you working backwards from there? Yeah, I'll work backwards from there because, um, you know, it's, it's easier to take away than it is to build it up, you know, and the intro can't be bigger than the back end, obviously, so, you know, yeah. usually just start at the back and work my way towards the beginning. Yeah, cool. So typically with intros, as Todrick said, you know, we're, we're trying to get into the tone of the story. So it's really before you're telling the story, you kind, kind of got to set the tone of the world that you're going to be in. So it could be anything from, you know, like a great rhythm to, it, depending on the genre of movie, um, you know, a, a good hook, or it could just be setting an atmospheric like sort of mysterious tone like that one you kind of knew they were there was the legend of Molly Crew right. and you, so you know you can kind of do a little bit of minimal exposition there but a lot of times um, you know an intro has to just be it has to have something that you can grab onto and it and it really shouldn't stay there for more than like 30 or 45 seconds because, you know. Oh, yeah. I mean, even then, I think it's still, you, the thing with, with every one of these acts is like, is like as soon as you comes, our editors have the shortest attention span ever. So as soon as you've gotten four bars and nothing's changed, they're like, next track. Yeah. Like, yeah. it needs to like continuously, continuously evolve. evolve and build. I mean, like, one of the things is like, you know, we're, we're looking, like, trailers, the music for that we're looking at is like, the music is a character in itself. Like, it's telling a narrative. Like, she was saying, you could tell from the opening of that Molly Crew song that we're like, this is the legend of this band, right? Like, let's put this in the scale. So, we're the musically, we're always looking for stuff that's like can tell its own narrative and be its own thing. Like, the trailer cuts itself to the music, and I always feel like the best editors are cutting to the music as, as opposed to like forcing a track into their cut, because um, I think editing is a musical, is a rhythmic uh, exercise, you know. So yeah, a lot of drummers end up as yeah, trailer editors, and they love that. Yeah. Um, so you know that's a big part is like telling a narr having a narrative spine through a track that you're following. So you know like with that one and, and some of the other things we're gonna play, you'll 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 see that like when she was talking about a hook or something, it, it could be anything from like a, a pad like that was. Maybe it's like a a string strike. Um, it's really interesting now too because we're moving into this place where it's like a new frontier even for us in marketing where you know people are using phones for everything. People aren't going to the theaters as much. They don't watch broadcast television as much, it's all kind of on demand. And so we used to have a captive audience. We used to be able to do slow build into anything we wanted to and you couldn't go anywhere because your movie's gonna start after this. So you're in, buckle up, right? But now everyone watches everything on an iPad or their computer or on their phone. And so you've got four seconds to get their attention. Uh, and how do you do that? You know, um, And so we're constantly looking for stuff. It's changing the way that we cut, it's changing the way that we write music. Um, and the things that we're listening for because we're trying to just get people's attention. Um, and the other thing is with all this stuff is that a trailer is, uh, it, we're trying to get people excited about something. So there's always a feeling of like anticipation um, and build and, and that kind of tension that's created with that. Like we never want to make you feel like complete after you've watched the trailer because then why would you see the film? Um, we want you to come out of that going, I gotta see that movie. So, I mean, those are two things I just wanted to put out before we get deeper into these songs and tracks. And when you're listening to the stuff that we're playing, these examples, be conscious of like, that these are the things we're thinking about when we're pulling tracks and when we're creating tracks, um, is like, we're, st we're trying to storytell um, from a two hour movie to two minutes and 30 seconds of, of build and, and all that, so. 
Anyway. The roller coaster yeah. of trailers. Um, so moving on from an intro, we start talking about the second act. So the second act of a trailer, as Todrick had mentioned, is exposition. a lot of exposition and storytelling. It's where you introduce um, a little bit of conflict before all hell breaks loose in your back end. And, you know, there are certain things, again, that we're listening for in, or that, you know, we're, we're trying to accomplish in the second act. So s some of those things, I kind of want to play a couple of tracks and you'll, you'll hear, like, the hook, the rhythm, the things that once you've set the tone, then you start things moving forward. So I might just skim through a couple of... Yeah tracks that you have definitely heard in multiple trailers. One of them has been, was just in two trailers in the same week, which is like the worst thing that can happen to movie studio executives, <laughs> but it happened. Um, all right, so just, you know, you'll probably recognize the snippets that I play, but. <laughs> Picture this, I'm a bag of put me to your lips, I am sick, I will punch a baby bear in his give me lip, I'ma send you to the yard, get a stick, make a switch, I can end the conversation real quick, I am crack, I ain't lying, kick a lion in his crack, I'm the I will fall off in your So what the thing about that song is that's kind of what it does, right? So it's got that incredible hook, it's got that really awesome bass line, but that's more or less what it does. And then the non-clean version of that song is completely unusable for marketing yeah. unless you're... listening a Red Band trailer. Doing a Red Band fine. trailer, right. Uh, but yeah, but the thing with that's a great example is like, so we would, where would we use this kind of cue? So we're going to use this in a comedy. Um, often we'll use hip hop for, for a comedy as for swagger, attitude. Um, we would use this maybe in like a fun action, like buddy cop movie, something like that. Um, th these kind of cues are animated, absolutely. Um, the clean, Depending the, on the studio. The clean version. Yeah. Uh, or the instrumental. Yeah. Uh, but like th those are the places that th this kind of stuff lives for us. Um, and like she's saying, like the rhythm's great. It bounces. You're immediately there. It's super cutty. You can, you could, you know, up stop, a bunch start. Of stuff. Yeah. yeah. You could stop down, do a line, drop back into it. Like it has all those, like the editor candy that everyone, that we all look for. Right. Um, and it's easy to sweeten with, with just editor using sound design too. So sure. you wouldn't even necessarily have to go to a music production house to sweeten it, you could just, as yeah. an editor, you can just drop in some bigger hits. Absolutely, and a rise and all yeah. that stuff. Yeah, um, sure. another very famous one that everybody's as sick of as covers, <laughs> but it works. Again, that's kind of all you need, really, to build a big old chunk of a trailer. I mean, that... Yeah. But the thing that's interesting, and it's funny comparing these two tracks, like, so the DJ Shadow song is pretty static, as is most hip-hop. Um, and it's a reason why a lot of hip-hop doesn't get used in trailers, unless we've really gone off with someone like Chris and fully built out a back end of it or added stuff. But Black Skinhead, and Kanye West in particular as a producer, uh, he happens to be one of these guys who just naturally is writing kind of epic tracks that have multiple changes and have scale and have dynamics. Because for us, like I said, our editors get bored so fast that like, you know, like I've pitched the, the DJ Shadow song repeatedly and they're like, well, where does it go now? Yeah. You know? Um, and so the, the great thing about Kanye is like his production consistently is like you get one, of the, there's always those like two or three tracks of record where you're like, that's a trailer track. It's going to be huge. And that's why it gets used over and over and over again because you try to replace it. It's really, really hard. Yeah, yeah. And, and similar to him, like uh, other artists that get used a ton is like Eminem's production because he'll do a, like a thing where he'll sample a classic rock song. So then all of a sudden you get the scale of like it goes from the hip hop into this rock world and then you kind of get this like modern take on a classic instantly recognizable track. Um, and there's always scale there. Like he, there, the, whoever he's getting to produce his stuff has a sense of scale and, and epicness that really translates into what we do. Um. And then just one more that I'm sure you guys have all heard. <laughs> Trailer gold in every way, shape, and form. All of it. It, it literally works in every single way. 
I mean, that song actually literally has a rise in it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's licensing gold. It really is. It's one of those songs that a music supervisor will hear and just be like, I want to be the first person to place this. I want to be the eighth person to place this. Yeah. <laughs> 16th. Whatever. Yeah, like whatever it takes. I just want to. But it has the same, all three of those tracks have a similar thing. They all can stop down for an editor. So like technically they work into the, the specs of what a trailer needs to do. Stop down for a joke, for a big line, a moment. Uh, they all have that swagger. They all feel fun and up tempo and exciting, um, and they give you they give you that juice of like, oh, this is like a cool movie. Right. And I did want to show, um, you know, I tried to find some. Sorry. Tried to find some tree fort artists that were in recent trailers, so I wanted to play this one from that has been staples. And this is a good example too. This isn't, I don't think either of you guys worked on this, right? No. no. Uh, this isn't mine or anything, but it's a really good example of uh, a trailerization of a track as well. So how many of us are there? So you can see like, you know, they, they doubled the drums, they added hits, there's rises in there. Um, it's like a pretty good example of what we do. Sometimes it can be as minimal, the trilization is adding a ticking talk sound to be a rhythmic motor through something to just push you through a track. Uh, sometimes it's a full on orchestration of a big back end and, uh, you know, giant strings at it. Um, but so those are all really good examples of like customizations on, on source. Um, but we can also talk a little bit about writing songs with the idea of sync in mind. And there's one artist that I feel like we've talked about a lot is Ruel, who has managed to walk this line between writing pop songs, but they're, they're structured in a way that is like tailor-made for promo and trailers uh, and marketing. Um, and we can play that right now. So this yeah. is like an actual original co song that... It's been licensed a million times. There's your first act. Dark and Haunting, Volume 3. <laughs> I mean, you guys, they're picturing a trailer in your head right now, right? Like... The second act where things are getting really bad in, in the world of The Handmaid's Tale. Oh, yeah, we're 
being trained to be an assassin. Yes. Universal lyric. And now now we enter a back end. Big action shots. You're seeing all your biggest special effects. All this stuff's happening right now, right? This is a wild game of survival. And so like for us, we might not even get to this part of the song. We might be like, oh, we're gonna do those big downbeats. We're gonna make that a big thing. We're in our back end. We can go straight to title, like. It kind of does all the heavy lifting for us in one track, right? Oh, and then the power. Yeah, yeah there's love that shit. But you see, every part of this song has something new to offer to an editor. So they'll never, their short attention spans are so satisfied by something like this. Yeah. She even has the, the fucking day card. Yeah. <laughs> so like, yeah. So you could see like, and and you know, I think she's actually an, an artist that's actively thinking about these things when she's working with her producers and stuff. I mean, I, I'm fairly confident. Because that's not really a traditional song structure either. Right. She's there's not a lot of verse, chorus, verse, chorus. Yeah. You know. But it still feels like a song. Yeah. And it still feels you know like we hear that stuff and, and especially like those lyrics. It's like it kind of frames what kind of a genre film we're gonna be working with with it, right? It's like oh. Any like you know female like hero or villain type film this would be great for any like Hannah type assassin thing this would be great for Alita Battle Angel this would be great for right. like there's these kind of movies that we get a lot and it's like this kind of checks a lot of boxes for us and like she was saying you know every time there was a stop down and another section came out something else was layered into it that was brought it that next level up the next level up the next level up and it kept feeling bigger and bigger and bigger without actually getting louder and louder and louder. That's the thing that I think a lot of people mistake when we say, oh, we want a back end where you just get, get huge. A lot of people equate getting huge with getting loud. Um, and loud is not interesting, but huge is interesting because it's about dynamics. Um, and maybe we could talk a little bit about that and like yeah. the space and the audio space and what the bandwidth yeah. is. I mean, like you said, a lot of people think, you know, when I'm working with my composers, they'll say, you know, that back end needs to be bigger and they'll just start adding stuff. But it's not about adding stuff, it's about making what you have sound big so sometimes it's about taking stuff away yeah yeah, yeah i mean a, a great example of that is like you know it's the classic thing but the the big bombs from like inception like that's the simplest arrangement ever it's brass just going bam, right but when you saw it in the theater the first time it was sh it shook you like you were like fuck that's huge it was just one instrument it's just huge you know actually you know what Let's play the um, let's play your Aquaman trailer because I feel like we've played some songs, and what we I really want you guys to hear what happens in um, in a big superhero trailer, like exactly what we're all talking about, but but applied to um, to a trailer, a more traditional trailer track. So yeah, pay attention to the same things: the axe, a theme repeated that's like a musical theme that you can catch, you can hook onto, that gets built on. This all has all of that but in a different context. Legend has it that one day, a new king will come, who will use the power of the trident to put Atlantis back together again. This is the exact spot that Volko gave me my first swimming lesson. I already know how to swim. Not even close. You have to forget all the teaching of the surface world. Go deeper. One cover your Atlantean instincts. He spent his entire life training. <laughs> training to be the best. My parents made me what I am. I am the protector of the deep. In this trident resides the power of Atlantis. In the wrong hands, it would bring destruction. 
But in the hands of the true heir, it would unite above and below. The time has come for Atlantis to rise again. You must stop him. And how do you propose we do that? By retrieving this. I already got one of those. Not like this one, you don't. The war is coming to the surface, whether you like it or not. Your mother always knew you were special. She believed you'd be the one to unite our two worlds. Atlantis has always had a king. Now I need something more. The world could be greater than a king. A hero. So, I mean, that cue has like a pretty, I mean, you guys hammer a theme on that. Yeah, yeah. It's very repetitive. Yeah, but but in a, in a really effective yeah, way. Yeah. Um, how did that come about? How did you, like, where, what was the starting point when you got into this trailer? Um, well, that was a pre-existing cue uh, that was heavily modified for this trailer. Um, so that started with a cue from your own library yeah. that you then built. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, um, we do that all the time. So, like, sometimes we'll go through source library and be like, oh, this track is almost perfect, or it's totally perfect. We love this, but can you do X? So. Yeah. What do you, what do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of the two, the two parts of a trailer track that we've already talked about, um, your, you said your process is writing sort of backwards, where you get yeah. your, you get your back end, or you get your theme sort of locked down first, and then you, you pull it back to create um, the full track. So. Why don't you talk a little bit about, just since we're still talking about a second act, um, why don't you talk about how that comes together for you? The second act? The second act, yeah. Um, usually, usually I do the back end first and then I'll jump to the intro and then the second act is just kind of how do we bridge the two uh, and you know help the trailer evolve and keep it interesting. So. I don't know, sometimes in the second act, I try to kind of get away from it a little bit. Um. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I mean, the, the big thing to me is like, uh, with this especially, is like the, is, is how effective it is. Like, see, sometimes we're like, we're like, oh, don't do the same thing over and over again because it's repetitive. But then in the case of this one, you have a theme where like you kept adding layers and layers onto it, that it started to get this point where you, you kind of get this forward momentum where you start to feel it more. And then when you hit that back end and you have the, the, the big soaring string doubling up and the choir by the very end, like you start to get the little goosebump moment of like, oh, this is so big and epic. But it's still the same chord production as it was on act one. It's just that you've, embellished and built and built onto the same on the same motif. So it's interesting because that's a really cool way of like making something bigger without making it louder, right? Like you've added the right things to it and still kept that space so, so it breathes. And then right. having that dynamic of like a like a big chord progression like that that has the spaces in between for phrasing, that air in between it get, makes those downbeats feel that much bigger, you know, and gives you that much scale. And compositionally a trailer motif tends to be much shorter than, you know, like a film score because it doesn't have a, it doesn't have the kind of time to really play out. So you got to get to the point. You really do, and you can and you can hammer it home as long as you're doing sort of variations on your established theme, right? Yeah, yeah. Trailers don't do nuance well. Like we just hit you with it. Like get you in and then ride it for the you know through the two minutes. Let's talk about the big back end. It's the most fun part of the trailer, and as Todrick has said, it's supposed to leave you wanting more. It's supposed to make you say, this is it, I gotta go buy my, mu my movie ticket right now, I've got goosebumps, or I'm really, really just like, I can't wait for this movie to come out. Yeah. So, we've we kind of touched on this, where some songs just already already have it, they, they just give it to you, and you barely need to do anything to them to get the back end that you want. Other tracks, 
need a little extra help and that's where someone like Chris would come in and sweeten it with drums or a pulsing bass or other sound design mm -hmm. elements um, you know it's how does that how does that call go like how, what kind of tactics approach would you take to sweetening something or just like an overlay or sweetening is just basically adding drums and strings or something like that yeah it depends on the the track that we're sweetening but mm -hmm. you know if it's like an older like a 70s or 60s track then it's you know it's adding bass or it's adding you know beefing up the drums so sometimes it's just like layering stuff um, yeah. oftentimes we'll have conversations about like like the reason that we're attracted to a certain cue is usually tonally. Like for us, the hardest nut to crack is always tone. Like, does this feel right to this material? Does this pop to picture? Does it make it feel like, like the one thing for me, the most successful music revision is when you don't notice the music because you get locked into the trailer or the show or whatever it is. And the whole piece is, is unified and you're just like along for the ride. For me, every time I watch a trailer and I notice the music, I go like, well, it's cool music, but maybe it's not a successful music music revision because you're I'm noticing it, you know. Um, so my my favorite moments always at trailer when I'm working is like when I'm supposed to be giving notes on music and I'm like watching the cut, but I like get lost in it and I'm like, oh wait, sorry, play it again because I completely got lost in it. But like so sometimes so because tone is the hardest thing to note. Once we track a track, get a track that feels right, maybe it doesn't structurally do the things we need, but we've nailed the tone. Then I go, well, we can always sweeten it with Chris. We can always call more at Audio Machine and they'll do what we want them to do to make this thing have scale or have changes. Um, because tone for us is like everything, uh, at least for me. Um, so a lot of times I'll call Chris or Mora or whoever and say, look, like we don't want to lose the feeling of this track. We don't want to get out of this vibe. Like whatever you add to it has to feel like it's part of this. We don't want to, f like a big thing too is I've seen clients more and more like even with trailerizing are like, well, don't make it feel like a trailer, you know, like they want it to still feel like the song, just the trailer version of that song, you know? Um, and so often, and, and Chris is really good in a very quick turnaround way of like kind of seeing the, what basically makes a track work and going, okay, cool. Like if we just add this underlying thing, it's going to give it that weight or, you know, because sometimes, you know, I, we get some people where they're like, oh, trailerize, we'll just put a rise on it and some quick drums and that's it. You got a trailer. And it's like, no, oh, that's, it's not it's really a little it. more. It's a little more involved than that. Yeah. I'm going to play a track that we worked on, um, a trailer that we worked on. We did a, a trailerization of uh, Cherry Bomb, but the Joan Jett version. And, um, you know, again, it, it had to kind of live in the world of the original, but it had to feel modern. Mm -hmm. And especially since it was not the Runaways original, it's a different master. Uh, we had to be, you know, we had to find that balance. Yeah. is different about Sabrina. I feel like I've been walking down this darker path. But maybe it's not so bad. Mm-hmm. She had a dark baptism, and there's nothing we can do to stop her. This is uncharted territory. Do you think you can handle it? I can choose to be afraid of my powers or I can use them. We've heard reports of levitation, the slaughter of demons, resurrection of witches. How does a first year half mortal student manage that? I feel I must warn you. This is who I am. Sabrina! You have loved the power I have given you. What is it you want from me? That was awesome. 
You guys noticing a pattern? <laughs> Any of this stuff? So, I mean, so part of this is really to get you guys, I mean, how many people here are composers or are interested in writing for trailers or any of that kind of stuff? Cool. So, so the big thing, the big takeaway from all this, I think, is like a structural thing and like there's to, to know the language of what we're actually looking for and asking for. Uh, we get called all the time with like, oh, I'd be great for trailers or I could write for trailers and you're like, can you? Because like it, it's, a, it's a different animal than any other scoring. You know, like she was mentioning before, like, you know, in film score, you've got space and time to establish themes. The music is playing an underscore, you know, it's, it's supporting an act, whereas in marketing, the music drives the editorial. It's the featured thing. I mean, it's just as, as big of a, sh of a part of it as the actors and the graphics and the, the storytelling. It's like a featured thing. So we're, there's elements in all these that are upfront, big, dark, stuff that like, gets you excited about stuff, anticipatory, it has tension, it, these, these things will build, and all this stuff is stuff that we're constantly looking for on tracks. So when you're writing stuff, there's a lot of stuff where you, you go, like, you almost get there. Like, there's so many artists we get where we're like, oh, if it only just did this, it would, it would be there, which is why we call on people like Chris to, to customize stuff. But I think the big thing is, like, knowing these kind of parameters and these tricks, but not necessarily writing it's like this balance, right, where if you like try too hard to fit into a box that it like just becomes kind of cheapened. But if what you're naturally doing, if you take what you naturally do and just apply the parameters to that in a natural way to what you're writing, it feels unique and like irreplaceable. Um, so yeah. And so much of it is dependent on production. You know, like we're all music fans. We love indie bands. A lot of times it's hard to use indie bands like guitar bands in trailers because the production just isn't there for marketing, for what our clients want to hear and what audiences will react to. So one of the things I want to talk to Chris about is, you know, as a producer, what are some of the, what are some of the basics that you, that you use, like the, the low end or the drum sounds or things like that that you go after when you're writing or when you're sweetening something like how do you take a rock song and turn it into a trailer song from a just like a really nuts and bolts production yeah i think over the years i've kind of built myself like a catalog of sounds that i use uh sound design stuff so it's like low hits and booms and rises and that type of stuff um so i just kind of you know know out of that what i need to pick to put in to to kind of take it to that place is there anything that like when you're working with your composers or when you're writing that you know are like no-goes? Like do you ever have a composer give you something and you're like, wow, this is really good, except yeah. if you use something at this frequency, you're gonna fucking turn off half the room or is there like yeah. a, like, you um, know? There's this one composer that I work with that uses this <laughs> big splashy symbol and it's just this big washed out whoosh thing which is, which is cool except it, it just for some reason that sound Every single editor will say, "Can you send me stems so I can pull that out?" Or <laughs> yeah, you know, saying, well, because well, the thing is, is that so this cue, these cues are living alongside in the same timeline with dialogue, mm. sound design, special effects. It used to be a narrator, but you know, not so much anymore. Yeah, really. things that things that, um, that are in the same range as as dialogue definitely yeah. are, are no go. So a lot of times stuff that's real mid-heavy, um, it tends to just feel like mud in a cut. And we usually look, so a lot of times we'll ask for the stems from a composer so we can like tweak a lot of the stuff or take some of the mids out and keep the stuff more dynamic in a low and high range. Uh, because uh, like it, that stuff will just like eat up dialogue and you can't, just can't hear anything. Mm. Uh, and sound design gets lost all the time or like, you know, like if there's a, a thing where we're doing something with like, oh, there's helicopters or there's a, whatever it is, like a lot of times those Practical sounds will be in the same register and, and, and bandwidth space as like amid the mids. So we're always looking for stuff that's not, like our editors hate when stuff gets mushy or mu like, you know, like muddy in the mix. Cause they can't, you can't, you want everything to be like really clear and cut through everything. Yeah. Yeah. That, I goes, mean, that goes back to the, you know, more is not always better. Right. Yeah. Thing also. You still want to compose for the mid range. You still want to have stuff. Yeah, there's stuff you just there. can't compete yeah. with. Yeah. yeah. I think it's like being really selective about like, your, you know, the, 
the arrangement of like how yeah, that's why the low end stuff works so well in trailers because it doesn't compete with dialogue or yeah like practical effects that are happening it's just you know it gives you that feeling without competing with anything the other interesting thing about that too is like uh is kind of knowing I mean, you can't really predict where stuff's gonna end up, but we've had, I've had experiences before with like uh, the Sicario score, where like, we, we got the Sicario score in when that Johan Johansson score came in, we were like, oh my God, these sounds are so rad, I can't wait to use this in a trailer. And we were on a TV campaign, I think it was for Logan, and we used the Sicario thing, and we, we like loved it. In our bay, it sounded amazing, right? But it was for TV spots. And so our client was watching the cuts, these TV spots, on his television. and none of the low ends came through the speakers and the television. You couldn't hear, it was just silent. There was all the low rep, the whole thing was built on subs and there was no subs coming through. And he was just like, where's the music in this track? Like, it's right there. And we had to, we, it took us so long. We got, kept going back to the studio, can you just like mix it again? Can we like add anything to it? I mean, I think, I, I think he sent it to me and said, what can you do with this? Yeah, we were like, it, we, was like a, we were like, we can't figure it out. Like we're hearing music on this end, but over there, like we, there's no music here. Um, so it's like those kind of things are stuff that we have to kind of think about. Like, oh, how is this going to play when it comes to your computer speakers versus a television versus you know being compressed on a radio spot? Mm -hmm. You know, um, those things are all like kind of we have to kind of plan for. Another thing that we often get, uh, you know, from briefs is the term signature sound, and in trailer music, um, it's almost equivalent to a riff, like that uh, DJ Shadow Run the Jewels track. Uh, where you got that great guitar riff they can just isolate. In a trailer track, you would um, use a sound design element called a signature sound. Do you want to talk about what a signature sound is and how you yeah, use it? Yeah, so, I mean, a signature sound, could, I mean, that's that means anything, really. So, like, the Brahm sound, that Brahm from Inception, or or your pings, or your piano, yeah, you know, piano strikes, strike, yeah. yeah. Ding, that type of stuff. That was in the Aquaman trailer. It was like, ping. Yeah. yeah. We, yeah. like the, we, they, we like to find these kind of motifs that we can build an entire spot around. So yeah, sometimes it's a solo cello going wrong, you know. Or the, or um, what was that movie that had the, uh, the big wall of colorful stuff? What was that called? What was that movie? Oh, uh, An An Annihilation. Yeah, Annihilation. That was it had those cool really cool sound. like synth thing. Yeah, yeah that was awesome. Yeah, that, yeah. That was a so really it's like cool those, those kind of things are like hooks, right? That like as a viewer, you're like, even if you don't clock it like consciously, it like gets you into this weird space, right? Um, and so we're always looking for stuff, and it could be a rhythmic tool, like a piano strike or a, a big downbeat. It could be a weird synth sound. It could be anything that just sets it apart, because when, when I first started in trailers long ago, the conversations were always like, well, what's the song for this campaign? And you would talk to a client, your producer, and they'd be like, well, what artist is this? And what's their story? And it's gotta be instantly recognizable. And now we've gotten to a point which I think is really interesting is that like a lot of times the conversations are like what is the sound of this campaign which is like obviously an infinitely more interesting question and really freeing and you it could be anything and one of the great things about that is it's really opened up the door for independent artists and people doing stuff that's not pop music or not on the radio because oftentimes the most <coughs> arresting and like interesting sounds are coming from like you know some German teenager's basement and like we're and to and I, what I, one thing I love about working in the trailer space is that like you get to work with those people and do stuff that you can't do to sell Tide. You know, you can't you can't do on a you know a CW show, um, but you can do in a trailer, uh, and and you can get pretty wild. You know, and it's fun. Yeah, and trailers are always looking to push from what it what it was a year ago is not going to be what it sounds like a year from now, with the exception of some of these the comedy campaigns and the yeah. family But even that things, changes too. I mean, when we started on animation and comedy, we were using ska orchestral. songs and swing music and big band. All the small things. Yeah, all the small <laughs> things. And, and now it's, yeah, I mean, when's the last time you used pop punk in a animated? It's all gone way more, I think, hip hop and electronic like music pop, has yeah. taken over, big pop. But so, I mean, so there's definitely trends that happen and we try to, st like, there's this weird thing with trailers, I think, where we're always looking for that next trend or that next, the next sound, um, but I don't think it's like a, I think oftentimes what happens is like, it's a natural occurrence. You know, it's like, we're really fun just trying to find the right sound for this picture, right? And sometimes it pushes the boundaries further and someone goes, oh, did you hear that thing? Do that again, you know? And so then we get stuck in that next loop of, okay, the trend now is dark covers. The trend now is minimal solo strings. The trend now is choral, the, you know, whatever the thing is. Every- Rhythmic. Rhythmic, yeah, the big, you know, you know, the sound design, 
Uh, guns, you know, that, that deal. Guns and cars and swords yeah. and baby driver. Baby yeah. driver, yeah. It's a good gag. Um, it works. So, I mean, so that's a big part of it. And so, like, as writers, like, if you're thinking about things and, like, how do I do what I do? Because every artist has their own voice and it has their own sonic space that they're, they're doing things in, right? So, like, how do you take what you do that makes you unique as an artist and put it into a commercial space like ours where it's something that, like, oh, I get the utility of it as well? Like, because we have to balance those two worlds. Exactly. Um, should I play M83 outro and have that be our last track that we play before we go into questions? Yeah, for sure. So like, we're talking about genre movies and stuff. So this is an example of a song that gets you, that's gotten used countless times. And what it does is it does, it does the fantasy in a modern way. Um, it does scale and magic and all that stuff, but in a really, really modern way. And you guys already know the song, I'm sure. Yeah. I might skip through a little bit. Yeah. This has been used in everything from, you know, family campaigns to Cloud tragic Atlas. romances, Cloud, Cloud Atlas. To selling a Lincoln. Ad nauseum. Yeah. I mean that that is again it's gold, you hear it and, yeah. and it's so it's a reference after how five years people yeah, we are still get called for that. Still calling it out. Yeah. I mean all the tracks that we've played you those are all reference tracks for us, where we're like, the client says, oh, we want something like M83 track from Cloud Atlas. We want something like Black Skinhead. Or they'll call out the trailer. Like It'll be like, oh, Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah. It's like, and you're just, you just are supposed to know. Yeah, exactly. What it is that they're going for. Yeah, um, they don't speak in like music terms. It's, it's obviously it's campaigns. It's al always campaigns. Yeah. And they will pull the most random campaigns from yeah. you know, 2008. And you're like, really? <laughs> but those are all really uh, effective tracks i mean they do the things whether it's the outro stuff it has an emotional you know the ma3 has an emotional thing where you feel it it's got scale it has those that slow burn big downbeat so you can do those long shots of like turning heads and big you know big hanging shots um and it's got that magical realism thing that yeah. you know that works great like and and actually you just touched on slow burn is a phrase that supervisors use a lot where it's a track that builds more gradually but all of the same things still apply. It's just that they don't make quite as fast uh, shifts. It's, you know, you still have your intro, but then it's a gradual evolution into a second act, and then you have a really, uh, this is a classic example of a slow burn where then it may stop down and then like smash in, but it's really just a long, slow progression of the same kind of thing. Yeah, our producers also call it a grow piece. Let's say, oh, we're gonna cut mm -hmm. up grow piece for this, or. We're gonna do a music video style grow piece where you're like, okay, there's gonna be barely any dialogue. It's all gonna be music heavy, and it's gonna be a thing that like takes you on this journey. And so, even with MA3, like we might do a track where we don't stop at all, but it still works in that three act way where like it's gradually, like she's saying, getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and we still do all the same story points that we would have done if we would have stopped down to run the jewels. But instead, we would keep going. You know, so it's like, like I was saying, it's like knowing the parameters, knowing the language that we're speaking in and what the, the box that we're trying to fit in and then applying all these other variables to that box, right? So, you know, 
we're always acting in three acts. We're always, these things are always, those are like the universals. No matter how we approach those things, we're playing in the same box, you know? And, and the, I was gonna point out, that's a very crashy symbol in that one, but that track is almost always used with no dialogue over it. Yeah. So I think yeah. that was an interesting point to me. It was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, you know, I think it's probably a good time to s ask if you guys have any questions. So, any questions? All right, there's a mic. microphone right here. Oh, wow. Thanks for this. Um, I wanted to know, as far as careers go, artists like M83, people like Trent Reznor, Atticus Ross, sure. they hit a point in their career where they're like, I've been doing this music thing for a while and it's been working for me. Do you, as industry insiders, have any advice, I guess, for where an artist might see a sign to turn their career more towards that direction? I think with all those artists, so many threes on scores, and obviously Trent and Atticus, uh, I think with both those, they, what, what I think what happened was it was a natural progression for them because, I mean, as an outsider, I, I mean, I don't know, but I'm assuming that M83, for instance, got 15 sinks for outro and saw a whole bunch of money come in and go, well, I could score a movie. You know, like I'm already scoring all this stuff, up, and they're already using my stuff, and well, I can obviously do this. And then I, and I'd also assume that at some point there's a fan who's a filmmaker who goes, oh, this was so good, or this, or this record's so amazing, I want you to score my film. And I, I guarantee that's the same with Trent and Atticus. Like, there was, I'm sure they were approached by somebody. I don't, I don't know, but I'm assuming that somebody at some point was like, I love your sound, I think it'd be perfect for my, what my project is. And we, we even do that sometimes uh, on the trailer front. Like, there might be artists that, there's, there's artists that uh, we, we'll call and be like, hey, you know, we think that you're perfect for what we're trying to do. Would you be open to doing something custom for us or working on one of your existing tracks for us um, all, all the time? Um, but I would say that it's something as an artist looking at this, that being aware of what the actual needs are from us, not even just creatively, but like time-wise and like commitment-wise, because once we commit to a track, there's gonna be rounds of revisions, there's gonna be notes, there's all this kind of stuff, and our turnarounds are really tight. Um, like, it's usually like a thing of like, you know. Yeah, like that Aquaman track that we, we would have to turn something like that around in a day. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then they're gonna send it to us, they'll work all night long. It'll be come in at nine in the morning for me or eight in the morning for me, I'll get it. I'll play that we'll play it in the cut and my editor will be like, oh, can we do this, this, this? And so at, at, I get it at nine o'clock at 9.30 on the phone and I'm saying, okay, here's your changes. Can we get them in four hours? <laughs> you yeah, know? Or an hour. Or an hour, yeah. depending, you know? Um, so yeah. But yeah, I think I would say the thing is it's like a natural, I think it's usually a natural thing. Um, but if you have stuff that's, if, you know, I, I think if you have stuff that lends itself to that world, like I feel like people will start gravitating to that stuff to score stuff, you know? Question way back there. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I hate to make this all about me, but I'm going to. Um, I made an album a long time ago with a multi-platinum producer. The artist blew up. They didn't play out behind it. The album has a good sound. The vocals are so-so. And uh, I've been trying to make my money back ever since. I've sent it to music supervisors. Music libraries like it, but I don't like their deal of like retitling and then the, yeah. the splits seem heavy. So uh, I wanted to know what guidance you might have for someone in my position. Because I, I, it's like the, the albatross of my life. <laughs> Thank you. You want to take that one, Chris? Sure. <laughs> I mean, my best advice would be to, you know, well, I would probably end up going with one of those libraries that was going to do that retitling stuff. I mean, it's it's your best bet because it's pretty easy to to do that as opposed to, you know, trying to call the trailer house yourself and get in touch with the music supervisors and yeah, you know, it's true. Like it's yeah. I mean, like a lot of it too depends on what. Like, I mean, I'm I don't know what the music is, you know, but not every so, so like for instance, like the stuff that we're looking for musically might not be what your record is. And the stuff that someone who works in ads or works on film and TV or works in video games or digital media or whatever, they all have different needs musically of what kind of stuff they can use. You know, if you're working in ads, typically you don't want dark, 
building, brooding, powerful, you know, big downbeats. You don't want, that's not, that doesn't sell cereal boxes, you know? But, like, but they love, you know, ukuleles and whistling, I suppose. You know, like, whatever the thing is. So I don't know what the music is, you know? So I would say, like, the first thing, if, if you are going to do it your own, and, like, I'm going to chart this, and I'm going to find supervisors and give my music to, <laughs> is knowing who you're talking to and knowing what they do and if your music is, and honestly ex assessing, one, does this music that I've made hold up to, like for me, for instance, like my biggest thing, I would talk to composers, they're like, oh, I have stuff. I'm like, cool. How does it compare to Kanye West, uh, Wagner, and, you know, fucking Radiohead? And if you can say, oh, it you know, fits in perfect, I'd be like, great, send me the record. You know, like because that's the space you're competing with. You're competing with Jimmy Page and Coldplay and Linkin Park and uh, Imagine Dragons, all these things, like it has to stand up to that because that's the space. I got two minutes and three seconds, I got three acts, I'm putting music in, does it hold up to that stuff? Um, and you have to say that same question to yourself for every other media that you're submitting to, you know, not to get off the train of trailer stuff, but like if you're talking to an ad person, knowing that what you do makes sense for what they do, because otherwise you're just wasting everyone's time, you know? So, but I, I, do, I don't think there's anything wrong with libraries. I use music libraries all the time, and it can be a great resource for artists and composers to make extra money. And, you know, if you have one record on you, I mean, I wouldn't stop with one record if you're a writer. Like, give that library that record and write another record, and just keep writing records, because it's all, con if, especially in the library game, it's all about volume, content. for sure. Volume, yeah. Volume, yeah. yeah. Get into the flow, and then let, your music make you money. Any other questions? And you can also negotiate, try to negotiate those splits too and see if you can get a better deal with the promise of additional music maybe. Yeah. Um, can you speak a little bit about finding either composers to work with, artists to work with, or just music? And you talked about one day turnarounds how does that work when you have to secure licensing for a song and budget and, and that type of thing? Yeah, um, I mean, yeah, we have two sides because we can talk about it from your side as like finding composers and my side as like looking for composers to work with. So yeah, I mean, we we get emails from composers daily, like several emails, and um, you know we, we listen to everything and, and if it's good, we hit them up and kind of put them on a mock project to just see how fast they can turn stuff around and what the you know production value is and if they hit all the you know marks then we will try them out on on a smaller gig and see how it goes but how does audio machine do that how do you guys source it it's it's almost the exact same process um usually we're listening for someone who's taking a different approach you know because we get a lot of trailer music and it sounds like trailer music trailer yeah. music so as a music supervisor listening to that stuff to for our library, you know, as, as potential composers, I want to be blown away. I want to hear something that we're not hearing from the typical, uh, you know, sound. And then for me, um, so because we are like, I'm like this like kind of pressure, I mean, these guys have pressure because they have to turn around this stuff on insane dialogue. I'm always apologizing to both these people for like, I'm really sorry I'm calling you right now, I really need this. Um, but so my position, when, especially when it comes to custom music, is I'm kind of in this weird pressure spot where I have a studio on one side that's just spent $200 million in special effects and acting and all this stuff that goes into making a movie, and their whole thing hinges on opening the opening weekend. What's box office opening weekend? So my whole thing is like, how do we get, the, I have this high pressure thing of like deliver for a client a music thing that's gonna help get butts in seats, right? So. I have that on one side, and, and I have a producer who's, who's my boss, who's their, their client is our studio, so they have this thing where they're depending on, like, it's gotta knock it out of the park, and I have a day to find this track, or I have a thing, or we're doing a custom thing, I need two days, and I turn on a custom piece. So I've got a trusted kind of Rolodex, I don't know if anyone even knows that is anymore, but I have my, my list of, like, of my go-to people that are proven that I've been using for 10 years that I know do something. Audio Machine is one, Ghost Rider is one. Um, there's a few composers that I go to on the regular for specific genres of films because I know they can do it. And I know that my producer has confidence that they can do it. I use that though as a way to also bring in new composers to the, fo the fold. The way I met Chris Bragg is a similar thing. I didn't know Chris as a composer before I started working with him. I was working with other libraries. And I had custom stuff going with other libraries, and I said, well, hey, look, man, I got another idea. Uh, there's, I've already got two composers already working on this. 
If you want to do a spec piece to just show me what you can do, give me an outside the box idea on this, a fresh look. Maybe I find something, a gem here. Uh, and that's worked, it's worked out that way. Like we got to finish on X-Men with you and then it, from there it's been an amazing relationship. Um, so that's what I try to do to get new composers in is I'll weave them in as like a outside the box, maybe this guy's super talented, I don't know. And if it doesn't work and, and it's terrible, I've already got two cues cooking right now that I, that I know I'm, I've got my bases covered. Um, but sometimes it works out great. I've had one where one of my producers, old r roommates from New York, uh, his friend came to LA and was a composer and said, oh, will you take a meeting with my roommate's friend? And I was like, oh, sh yeah, sure. And he came in and I was like, well, this stuff's really actually interesting and you're doing something different. Why don't you try, to, hey, we're working on Blade Runner 2049, why don't you just try something? I'm like, I already got three other people working on this, but like, see what you can do. And he turned in this amazing piece of music that actually went to finish. So it was like, he got a, like his first uh, marketing piece that he got to finish on was his first time ever trying to write something and it was just because he came at it from a totally different place. Mm -hmm. So it just really depends. Um, but that's what I try to do is like, you know, sometimes it doesn't work out, sometimes it does. That's good advice too for uh, trailer composers, people trying to get into it is don't do what everybody else is doing because there's enough people doing that. Yeah. It's kind of a flooded market of people doing the same thing. Absolutely. So do, do something different. It's like what I'm saying is like a, you as a writer, you have your own voice musically and it's like play to your strengths. The worst thing I ever get is when, and I've had this happen from like name, I'm not going to name who they are, but like big named artists, people who are like, yeah, I'm going to start doing trailer comp composition. And in your head, you're like, oh, this guy's got the craziest you know, guitar sounds, it's gonna be some crazy feedback thing, it's gonna be badass. And it comes and it's got strings going dunk, 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 and then a choir kicks in, all this stuff. You're like, why are you trying to make trailer music? Just do what you do. Yeah. You know, so it's like, I, I always feel like the special stuff comes from you because you're the, you're the individual, you're the artist. So like, don't make what you think trailer music is this. That's bullshit. Like, make what you do and just know in your head, like, I know they have to get from A to B to C. In their, in their thing. How do I take what I do and put it into that without cheapening my own personal, you know, brand or sound or whatever, you know, what, what you want to call it, you know? Yeah. And so much of it is also trust. You yeah. know, it's trust that comes over years of working together and if you start to engage in any projects with trailers, just know it could be nights, weekends, whatever is the most inconvenient time for you personally <laughs> is when you're going to get the call and yeah, say yes. Take, say yes and take it and see it through. You, once you're in, you have to see it through. I was, taking, I was taking phone calls about X-Men when I was uh, at the hospital delivering our first baby. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> we, it, the, California was on fire, pretty much the entire state, and I had composers. Uh, Rubino was uh, evacuated from his house, and he took his his mobile rig and worked at his friend's house <laughs> on custom. Um, I've had composers have their wives text me from uh, the s operating room that they were gonna be out of recovery within two or three hours and that they would work on the project that night. Brutal. You guys like are all, everyone's like, eh, Still want to be yeah. trailer composers, guys? <laughs> I mean, if you think it's hard to be a trailer music supervisor, try being a trailer composer. I know, I, for sure. I'm always yeah. like, I, I mean, I, I apologize to these people daily. Just like, I, I know. Can you, guys, I'm so sorry. Uh, it's me again. Or I always open everyone, like, do you hate me yet? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And we work for free. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the other thing. So a lot of this stuff, it's all this spec. custom music, they're doing on spec. It's not even with a guarantee of getting paid anything. Uh, w w like, you know, what's... For, for instance, like both you guys can talk about like how, like out of all the stuff that you're pitching for on a custom thing, how many of these things go to finish? Well, I say it's about 30% yeah. for us. I mean, we work on between- And that's high for the industry, by the yeah, way. Yeah, we, we work on between 15 finishes. and 25 customs a week. And yeah, I mean, 70% of the stuff we do ends up in the trash can, so. And especially if you're dealing with you know, songs that are someone else's intellectual property, like uh, let's say you're working on Aladdin and it's, um, you know, songs from Aladdin that you're trailerizing or doing whatever. That's, if you don't get that finish, you, there's nothing you, you can do. You can't else, do, yeah. use it for anything else. And on top of that, these guys, we're, we're getting multi-vended. So our clients are coming to us 
as a trailer shop, but they're also going to three to four to five to six other trailer shops on the same campaign, the same job. And every supervisor and producer at all those shops has a concept of how they're gonna sell this movie. So three of us might call the same shop composers to do different ideas. And they're kind of like banking on like, well, one of these guys is hopefully gonna get the finish so that this all makes it worth it. But you know, everyone's competing as different stuff. So even though that we're on a movie and they may have, we might have three cuts that we're sending that have two Chris Trues and two and a Mora Q, none of ours might finish and some other shop might get the work and all that work doesn't go anywhere, you know? And we try to make ourselves feel better as supervisors and go, well, we developed a queue with you and you could put it in your library and hopefully it lands somewhere else. And I always hope that maybe that's true. It is. Sometimes, yeah. yeah. Unless yeah. they're really specific, which a lot of the times the cases are, you know, the songs are created very specifically for a project and they're kind of unusable yeah. for anything else. Anyway, that's sad. Does that answer all your <laughs> questions? <laughs> <laughs> now I feel worse. <laughs> you should. Um, you guys mentioned, and like everyone talks about, the trailer industry being very trend focused and like something's hot this year, something's not. What's one thing that each of you hates that's a trend right now, and what's one thing that you hope becomes, that you see more of? Uh, I hate dark covers. <laughs> I'll, I'll just okay. go ahead and say it. I, I, I don't know. I hate doing them. I've been doing them for so long, and it's just like uh, another dark cover. But th there's a reason why they still use them is because they work really well, you know, for what they are. They do yeah. a great job of selling movies. So that was the first thing that sprang to mind for me too. Is that dark cover? To me, it, as a as a lover of trailers and as a movie consumer. I feel like it cheapens the campaign. It's supposed to do the opposite, but because it's so played out now, to me, it feels more like, oh, it's, it's like it's TV joke, promo yeah. fodder. Sometimes that can work in the opposite, though, where a really horrible movie all of a sudden looks like an actual film because they use the same tropes as other movies use. True. Yeah. Very and you true. go, oh, that's just another one of those movies. All right. And we're like, great. They think it's another one of those movies. Right. <laughs> you know? um, I actually don't, I, I understand the frustration with dark covers because it, I agree it's overused, and but I think so are electric guitars and so are drums. I mean, uh, to me, it's just another tool in the toolbox. Mm -hmm. And one thing I will say about dark covers, then I'll go on the record, is as annoying as anyone might, thinks that it might be to do the same thing again, it is the, it's done a fucking wonder for independent artists. You're talking about artists get finishes in Avengers. I mean, the biggest, you know, fucking Justice League, the biggest properties on the planet, right? And you'll get an unknown artist who creates a dark piano cover in their fucking living room, and they'll do a cover of a known copyright, and all of a sudden they're being played to billions of people on the planet. Like, where does that happen? You know, so to me it's like another tool in the toolbox that gets overused. You maybe you just don't rely on that hammer as much, but like, I don't think that's necessarily bad. Like, they're all tricks, you know. The it's not bad, I just don't, I, I'm just bored of just over writing yeah, well, those. Sure, yeah. sure. And you know what, just a hot, Tip. If you do get any kind of placement for a cover as an artist and you land in something that's going to be pretty big, you should really make sure to have all of your internet information out there so that people can find you because um, the, the world of trailer music fans is crazy, worldwide, rabid. They it's want a, it. They're, they're the greatest and worst and weirdest fan base there's actual like commercial music fans, but instead of buying pop records, they buy trailer albums and they hunt them down. Yeah. And since the stuff's not usually commercially available, I, I hear all the time of people calling and being like, hey, uh, I'm a music supervisor at <coughs> Trailer Shop and I, could you send me volume three of blah, 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 blah? And you're like, yeah. what? Yeah. There used to be like a big eBay when, when trailer libraries would release CDs or DVD, audio, or even drives, they, there was a big eBay market for it. They would go for hundreds of dollars on eBay because they're not commercially available and these people just want to live really epic lives. Yeah, the most <laughs> epic life ever. Like most epic grocery store trip, right. doing your laundry is insane. Like yeah. that's huge. Audio Machine Music is in a lot of uh, Peloton videos, which is part, illegal. Part of that lawsuit? <laughs> we should be. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, the question was, what things are starting to happen that you, we wish you could see more of? That was for the video. Oh, yeah. I, for me, I just get really excited the more out we can push stuff. Like, 
to me, I get really excited. Like, I really get excited, especially seeing stuff that's happening in the horror space right now because they seem to be the most adventurous when it comes to sound design and like really pushing the boundaries of what's music. Um, a big trend, or trend really, is like cues that are sound design, built around sound design, and are more, uh, they still have scale and do all the things, but they, they're, they're, not, they're not traditional instrumentation. Um, I, I really, have, I love that kind of stuff, and I think it's really cool when stuff can be, I, I personally think it's great when stuff really pushes the limits, where you're like, is that even music? You know, I think is cool. But I do think that a current trend that's happening right now is actually uh, uh, almost a reverse of that, where we're seeing a lot of like organic instrumentation done really simply. So, um, but still doing the same stuff we've all been talking about, these three acts, the scale, the build, but it's done in a way where like, maybe it's just a solo string line, and it's, getting more and more intense, the playing, or uh, a piano line where, where as you're building, other pianos are getting added to it, or th those kind of things we're seeing a lot of, um, and we get asked for a lot of it. It's lots of real taut string stuff. Um, really raw um, yeah. room sound, or like yeah, really Yeah, stuff close where you really mic. hear all the attack, and you hear all that. Like, we get a lot of that, I think, is a, is a big trend right now. Um, but it's still that applied to the same thing. So if it's that, it's like a rhythmic, it's using strings in a rhythmic way so they can still cut. Because we still do the same thing. Like it's, the, it's just like how, like I said, it's the same thing, applying those, those different tool sets to the same parameters and the same rules, but like just trying to reinvent how we get there, you know? You took the words out of my mouth. I, I love uh, this horror thriller space. It's not just like slasher stuff, but I, like the mother trailer was a big one. Oh, that was great. The us campaign was great. Awesome. Um, you know those kinds of things are. Mandy. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, Mandy it's trailer, interesting killer. stuff. Yeah. Hereditary. Hereditary. All that Colin Stetson campaign. like circular breathing stuff. Oh, the witch. It's definitely the funnest stuff to write is horror stuff because there's like no, there's no boundaries really. Yeah. It's like anything can be. Just like does it sound scary? Is it sound creepy? Okay, cool. Go. You yeah. know, like, uh, yeah. Any other questions? Oh, we were counting on you. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, since you were saying like, like all of these have like a certain production value and a certain kind of tone, are, are there any tools that you have found are just super helpful? I mean, it could just be a plug-in, like plugins or like anything that like makes things quicker. Yeah, um, I mean, I have I have like a a template built mm -hmm. that kind of does everything in one pass. So, so. I open it up and it already has all my string patches, all my percussion, everything is loaded already. So I can just kind of hit the ground running. It already has all my, you know, my hits and rises and wishes and everything are already sitting in that session ready to go. So it's pretty quick to get something put together. And then when it comes time to, you know, send it off the Todrick or whoever the client is, it's just one record pass and I have all the stems and everything done. So, it, you know, building something like that is definitely really helpful for the workflow. And, and I think too, it just to also is like, I, I, I always like it when the composers aren't relying on in the box sounds and stuff. Um, a lot of times like, what's great about his studio too, and, and I'm sure a ton of composers, but like he, he can record live instrumentation well and, and weave it into the sounds with the, uh, with the box stuff so that it doesn't just feel like, because if, every, if all the production was just the like, I don't know what, East West or whatever those things are, like then everything would sound the same. So it, you know, I'm always looking at, especially when I'm talking to outsider composers and stuff that aren't in, it's like, oh, what are you doing interesting? Oh, you've created your own instrument? Oh, well, that didn't sound like anything else. That's cool. Like, th I love that kind of stuff. Um, and, and, and like I said, like any of those gags that you can do that like differentiate you from the 30 million other composers that we're getting, like there's only to your benefit and to make our work better, you know? So uh, thanks for being here. This has been super informative. Um, I haven't had a lot of knowledge about any of this kind of stuff before, so thanks for just being here. I guess my question is, uh, how do you go from being kind of, um, you know, not on a label, not really associated with any kind of management and stuff like that, and getting connected with music supervisors to sort of get your foot in the door, get that opportunity that you've talked about, where it's like you got your shot, you got to really go for it and nail it when you um, when you get it. But it's like, what do you think is the best way to kind of get your foot in the door without, you know, having any sort of in, so the, to speak? The easiest way, I think, is to go through, you know, a company like mine or, or you know, Morris Company Audio Machine. It's We're pretty accessible to everybody. You know, our emails are on our websites and 
people just send us tracks. So that's that's probably the easiest way to get into it. And again, it just depends on the kind of music that you're making, um, because there are a lot of agencies that music supervisors work with that they trust. That so they are sort of um, the middle man between you and music supervisors, and they know everybody, and they have great reputations, and we trust them as music supervisors. Um, so. I would say make sure that all of your, you know, like you're putting music up on SoundCloud, you have stuff available, maybe Bandcamp or something like that, because music supervisors do lots and lots of deep dives and, tr you know, in trying to find music, make sure that your metadata is there, make sure that your stuff is findable on, on the internet, because music supervisors are searching, um, you know, and recommended if you like, you know, that kind of thing. So have it all together in one place that looks good, you know, and looks looks like relevant and cool, and you know, like you're if you're trying to market yourself to marketing people, for example, you know, music supervisors, um, it has to look like something we we'd, we'd want to hear. We'll give it a chance. It should sound good. It should be readily available, and then yeah. you will you you will get found. You know, if if it's something that people feel is licensable for <laughs> for any kind of sync. Yeah, it's funny. Is like a the, the marketing yourself, because I mean, you as an artist, you're a business, right? Like, and if you don't think of yourself that way, you're like, then what are you doing? You're not professionally a musician then, right? So like, uh, the branding thing is interesting because I'm like a very visual person, and I swear like when I get submissions from like even like libraries or like stuff, if the graphic design sucks, I'm like, man, the music's probably not that good. We just, did this, we just did this like, walking by coffee shops this morning. We're like, oh, we're not going on that coffee shop because that's like basically the you know papyrus font. Yeah, got papyrus logo. font. <laughs> you know, like we're that not espresso going is gonna suck. They got papyrus font. <laughs> there's, there's no way that's good coffee. Yeah. Like the good coffee comes to the place that has the subway tiles. We all know this. Like that's where the espresso is. We're gonna go to that one. Obviously, uh, guys. Yeah. So, but it's the same. I mean, for me, because I have to go through so much music sort to source, right? So, like anything that gives you. A, a polish or an edge that makes me go, oh, what's this? Oh, the album artwork's, it's not just a, a knight with a flaming sword fighting a space dragon. It's something interesting. Oh, well, what does this sound like? You know, like, um, not that there's any, sometimes I need those space dragon tracks though. So, I mean, there's nothing against those, but you know, like, uh, you know, like that's, that's the thing. It's like do, doing stuff that like makes our life easier or it makes you stand out. Like a big thing is like keeping all your links active on your emails that you send out because I'm gonna do, I use my email as a search tool all the time where I'm like, I remember someone said they had crazy base things and I'm like, go like, oh, that one. And then you click the link and it doesn't active. And I don't have time to email you and ask you to put the link back up. I just go, all right, well, forget that one, next and one. Yeah. The searches that come in, come in at all hours of the day and night. So yeah. you could be working at 11 o'clock at night and you need to turn in a search in the morning there's just no time, yeah. you know. So and invest like, in, you know, Dropbox and have your stems, your instrumentals, have everything readily available, and just keep writing, keep producing. And, and also, I, I love it when people tag stuff with what key their cues are in, um, because often we're mixing and matching between different songs. And BPM. So if, and BPM. But if I know that, like, oh, this is also in F, or this is also in whatever, like, I can then match it to a track and use it as an opening act or a drop out and go to this pad or whatever the thing is, and it really just makes everything easier. Um, and just like, yeah, like keeping all your stuff, like if it should all be readily available, your stems are there, everything is ready and like easy. Um, and then as far as like meeting supervisors are getting, it's like these kind of events are great. You're, you're here now, we're meeting, you know? So like, congrats. <laughs> <laughs> Along the same line. Um, so if we're emailing you, like what's the best approach to stand out or like to, and like if I've, like if we've won, like, Infest, like I do films and stuff, or, like, or I and mean, I score my own films. But um, like, if we've won an award on a score, do we like? Was that something you'd sure. want to hear, or like, do you just want to hear like our regular songs, or like, cause like, I mean, I've done scoring for films. I've never scored a trailer, but it's like something I'm kind of interested in. So. Yeah, I mean, I mean, all those things are like stuff that like when you're saying an email is like, oh, I've done this and this and this. This is the kind of stuff I, the kind of like media, like genres I work in, or this is what kind of stuff, you know, like I, I think those, any of, that, any of that information is just more ammunition for me to where I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Because like, like my, my filter is like the hardest one to get past because there's just so much music. So it's like, it really has just stuff that, stand, anything that makes it stand out or pop, you know, like I really like it when people are like conscious of who they're emailing, like 
like it's not just a blanket email. Like if you're like, oh, I saw that you guys, like I, I looked on your, the Mob Scene website and I saw that you guys finished these campaigns. I actually also write dark superhero epic songs or I also do horror things or whatever. Then I go, oh cool, that's the composer who does that. They actually research what we do. They know who we're talking to. It's not just like, like the worst thing is when you get the blanket email and it's like, dear Phil, and you're like, oh man. Like, <laughs> I've, <laughs> I've gotten emails where it's like, I researched all your work and I really like it. You know, I think <laughs> you would like my music. It's like, do you think, what? Yeah. Do you it's like copy paste, or the, the font changes, like, dear right. Todrick, and then it's like, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. the font, and I'm like, ugh, oh, fucking copy paste, yeah. man. Showing that you've done some homework, showing, showing up here and hearing what we're listening for, and then if you still think that you have tracks that might work in a trailer setting, or that you want to work on, you know, composing to trailers, I, you know, one thing I would say is practice to scoring a trailer. Like, take the sound, strip the sound out of a trailer, and rescore it as practice. Um, do homework, and if you want to reach out to music supervisors or you want to reach out to uh, libraries, research them and understand kind of what they're known for, what they've been working on lately, and then show why you think that you could either fit in or grow with that company. And I don't know if this is just my bias, but and it's, it's a that's probably a terrible thing, but I'm going to tell you and, and I'm going to admit to you that. I have a different, um, I have, I have different, uh, like, my standards for where you're coming from differ based on what you do. If you're an artist, right, like if you're doing like, you're an abstract electronic music artist, right, and you send me stuff like, hey, I think my stuff might work for trailers, and you send it to me, when I'm listening to your stuff, I'm not putting my trailer music ears on, I'm listening for sounds, right? If you come to me and say I'm a trailer music composer, and you send me something, my, what I'm listening for changes. And now I'm listening for you, are you actually a trailer music composer? So if you're approaching me as a composer, and I mean, that's unfair, you know, like maybe I'm missing out on great talent if I just would have given them notes, but because of the pressure and because of the time, I'm looking at it differently. My, percep my perception changes based on what the source is. So if you're giving me stuff as a, as a trailer person, you come to me and I'm like, this is not trailer music, I just write you off. And, I'm, and it's bad, and I'm sorry. But it's not, un it's not unfair because he, the, the big difference between film score composers and trailer music composers is the back end is make or break. And it's really hard to produce someone to understand what goes into a trailer back end when they're a film score composer or a European composer. We were joking about this, like a lot of guys over there have a different mindset about how big it should be in the back end. So a lot of times, w you know, we, it's frustrating and it's hard and it takes many revisions to try to get someone to understand what a trailer back end sounds like from a score uh, standpoint. Yeah, or it's just like, it's like a language that you have to learn, and if you're not fluent in it, I need you to be fluent in it because time is an S of the essence and the pressure is insane. So, and like, like you know, he said, four hour turnaround, 24 hour turnaround for a custom track. If I go to you and you don't speak the language and you're not, you're not proficient, I'm gonna get something that I'm like, I can't turn this into my editor, I can't, like this, I can't. Yeah. And that's it, you know, like, I'm not going back to you for, to, for round two, like, there's so many, like, sometimes you get stuff and you're like, there's, I don't even know, where, like, someone will send me a track and it's like everything, they have every idea they've ever had in one track, they're like, I'm going to show you everything I can do in this one track, and I, I never call them again, because I'm like, we don't need everything, it's, you saw all these trailers, they all had one idea, and they built on that one idea, and that's where power comes from in trailer stuff. As soon as you throw in the kitchen sink, and then it's going to go, and we're going to do this breakdown, and then we're gonna, this is going to happen, and this is going to happen. I'm like, man, that is like six different cues in one track. That doesn't work in a trailer because it takes you out of yeah. the trailer. I mean, good trailer music, you shouldn't even know it's there. Aside from it sets yeah. a mood. But if, if, you're if you end up like going, oh, that's kind of cool, I'm listening to the music, it's... it's you know, doing an injustice to the trailer. I agree. And the thing too is like we were saying earlier, like we're building anticipation, right? We're trying to build tension. Anything you do that breaks that tension ruins the cue for us. Like one thing that drives me crazy is say we're doing like one of the gags that we use a lot is like a tick-tock, you know, and then right? You see it countless times. It works because it gets your pulse going. It makes you feel like, oh shit, something's gonna happen. This is crazy. You're running out of time. You're running out of time, right? The worst thing you can do as a composer is you go, you're building my tick, 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 tick. 
What happened to all the fucking tension? Now we're in a sweep or something. You're like, well, I just lost all that. You built all that real estate. Of you, you, bought, you brought me along all this way, and then you're going to leave me. And now I have, now it's, it's wasted. It's like you've got to keep it going. You've got to keep building. You've got to like it. Yeah. It's all about anticipation. It's all about like the want of like I want to know what's going to happen. I can't wait. I can't never, look away. Never resolve. Never resolve. Never, no major. Never. Yeah, <laughs> no never major. resolve. Ding. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because you, you want that feeling of like I have to see this movie, right? All right, are we all set? No more questions? Anybody else? Thank you guys so much yeah, for coming you. here. It was awesome. See, now you should play outro. Oh, yeah. As we're walking out, you play outro, we're gonna have an epic day. <laughs> Thank you guys.